psychology right that turn in this whole dimension of affect science right that's that, that looks at the face as a register right. of these biological emotional precursors right and so right I'm you're, very interested i was gonna say you're ahead of me in this i had never heard of any of this so i walked into this lecture and i was just blown away yeah. i was actually waiting for my lecture to start and i walked into the room ahead of time and there they were doing this thing and there were a big room of people and they were all from all over the country and they all knew what he was talking about we need to get a hold of these people because uh -huh. one of the things that we're interested in we've talked to a dozen neuroscientists now right and there's a huge black hole. I mean, despite the general radiation out in the public, the right. neuroscience understands what's going on with reading. Right. They can get nowhere near the the timing mm -hmm. of the precarious right. interactions between parts of the brain that are involved in okay. the assembly of reading. Right. They're nowhere okay. near. Okay, now the person who claims to know the most about that is Sally Shaywitz. Read my interview with her. It's online. Okay. I push it right to the edge, and she says, yeah, we just don't know. Oh, wow. I would like to read that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do not know. Okay. They, they radiate that they do, but they right. don't. Right. They, they That's don't what know. I thought. I asked, right. is, for example, is there a brain uh, scan, or is there any mechanism that mm -hmm. you're aware of, that science is aware of, that can uh, detect a, um, a signature in the development of a brain before they've been exposed to reading that will predict their reading difficulty? Mm. No. No. Sure. Well, that's a hard question. I know it is. I know. Right. Then the next thing is, relative to ERP and fMRI, do we have any instrumentation that will allow us to see things at the frequency of exchange, data frequency of exchange rate that's mm -hmm. happening between visual and auditory components mm -hmm. and whatever mm -hmm. that's creating this virtual assembly, mm -hmm. can we see anything that, at the exchange that's happening at that level? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all we can see is, is I, one of the analogies I use is the, uh, you know, Federal Express. We can say, well, Houston's brighter than Los Angeles, mm -hmm. but we can't right. tell <laughs> how the critical packages are moving right. between the right. cities. Right. Right. That's where readings happen. Right. Right. Okay, well, we ready to go? Mm -hmm. Looking good there? Do you want to kick the other light up on? You can do a test. It's the controllers over there. It's pretty, the lights are not particularly strong. You okay with the heat? Right? Oh, yeah, no, I'm, no problem. All right. Just push that, right. I, I can tell my own energy is a bit erratic. Mm -hmm. running on three hours of sleep. Yeah, I was going to say, you guys should rest up and do, you know, t do this when you're ready. No, 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 we're ready. All right. I've been looking forward to this since... Oh, my God. Yeah. All right, yeah. whatever. Since I, uh, you, uh, had the <laughs> I'll try to, to live up to your... Uh... Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Let's, uh, let's start with one of the things I really like to help people get is not just what somebody knows, but how they came to know it, their okay. lens, their mental lens, how they, not what they, not just what they've learned, but how they learn, what's driving their learning, you know, what have they learned that's been this kind of scaffolding that's brought them to the vantage they have. So a, uh, a short version, you know, mm -hmm. 10 minutes at most, right. on that theme, if we could start with that. Okay. Um, well, I'm a sociologist. I've long been interested in poverty and inequality and how uh, poverty is passed on from parents to children. I worked at Apt Associates, which is a think tank that does studies for the federal government. And this was in the late 70s, early 80s. And I studied a program that was going to try and keep low-income kids in school by giving them a part-time job during the school year and a full-time job during the summer. And it turned out it was too little too late. By the time a kid is 18 years old, um, a minimum wage job is not a big incentive for them to stay in high school. And what I learned was that um, the kids' skills were very low and their work habits weren't that good. Um, so I decided that if you were interested in this, you had to start earlier. And when I was teaching at the University of Texas at Dallas, I went to the school district. I found out they had data with younger children. Um, I studied that data. I gave a talk on that data. A guy from the business community came up to me from Texas Instruments and said that um, they were involved in school reform. And would I join them and help them? 
And I started doing that, and then they said, well, tell us something we can do. This is not academic. And so I looked at my data for Dallas for 1986, and I saw that 7th and 8th grade kids had an average reading score at about the 5th grade, and that you would capture most of their reading if you looked at the distribution between 2nd grade and 8th grade. So uh, most of them were reading well below grade level. And so I told the business guys that they should work on that. And they got us an elementary school to work in. And when we started doing that, their idea of working on it was to tell the teachers to vision what they wanted to be. And the teachers would vision they wanted to be number one and then go back in the next morning and do the same old thing with kids who were at the bottom. And so I decided I'd have to do it myself. And so I read the literature on interventions and got into reading and reading interventions and invented my own tutoring program and started doing it with college students. And that was around 1990. And um, the fact that a lot of the kids at risk are ethnic minority, African-American or Hispanic from large central cities, um, and that our son, wh who we adopted when he was three months, was um, black from uh, Central City, Fort Worth. And the fact that the babysitter we got for him was an eighth grade African-American kid in the neighborhood who, it turned out, could only read at about the fourth grade level. And when I tried to work with him, he told me that it wouldn't help because he was stupid and he was mentally unable to learn. And as I worked with him, I realized that he had simply failed to learn to read in first grade, and the negative feedback of that failure was what ruined the rest of his school career. So the combination of looking at statistical data, talking to people, and looking at a few real lives was what convinced me that I understood the situation and that I should be aggressive about pursuing my point of view. This led to um, becoming noticed um, by the administration later, right? Right. Um, we invented this tutoring program, which built on two well-known previous programs. And we then discovered that there was this thing called phonics, and we needed to do that. And we were very successful with the schools in the short to medium run until politics took over. And so we grew a program where, in a few years, we were tutoring 2,400 kids with 300 paid tutors in the city of Dallas. And we were in 32 elementary schools, and the principals had invited us in, and they were paying our tutors essentially a minimum wage using Title I money. Um, and the guys from Texas Instruments who had gotten me started on this um, said, write us a paper that um, does what you said we need to do, which is get all kids reading at grade level by third grade, because K through three is learning to read, and above that is reading to learn, so that if you fail to read at grade level by third grade, there isn't any teacher beyond that whose job it is to help you or who's likely to succeed in helping you. So I wrote that paper, and they took it to the superintendent of schools and thought he would sign on to this idea and this plan, and he said, no way. So they took it to Governor Bush, and this was in Texas, and I sent it to an old student of mine who worked in the Federal Department of Education, and he sent it to the White House, and it ended up in a stack of papers of similar things on Gene Sperling's desk, and Gene Sperling worked for Clinton, and the administration ended up announcing a reading initiative um, just before uh, Clinton's nomination for, the, for his second term. Um, so that was our moment of fame, and, and we did have some impact in um, creating um, the program that, that focused on literacy and involved college students as tutors. That program continues um, as a part of No Child Left Behind, and, and the Bush people have sort of their own version. Um, but it has been a, a, a regular effort of the administrations since 97 now.
Um, in fact, it's a controversial part of No Child Left Behind now because there's funding for a lot of tutoring, but it's not clear that it's being institutionalized very effectively. So it's not clear the services are delivered very effectively. But there's a lot of talk about it, and there's a lot of private sector companies springing into existence to spend this money now. It's an ongoing story, in fact. Uh, Do you remain involved with it? No, except, well, at a distance. Um, there are some people who work for the administration who assist people who want to do tutoring interventions. And occasionally, I participated in a group that wrote um, regulations for ideal tutoring programs that the department published. And um, Alpha Kappa Alpha, which is an African-American sorority, got a grant from the Department of Education to do a large-scale tutoring demonstration. And I ended up advising them and then training them. So every now and then, I get called on to do something. But other than that, I'm not as involved as I once was. I'm sort of more back being an academic now. Somebody did, in fact, ask me, there's going to be a conference at Wisconsin next spring, and somebody asked me to write a paper about um, what's been happening with tutoring. And I'm actually intending to try to write that paper and figure out what's been happening with tutoring in the last couple of years. Excellent. So <clears throat> while you may have moved back from this uh, particular uh, venture, uh, you've nonetheless uh, situated yourself, at least in terms of, you know, and I'm certainly not aware of the, you know, all of your work, but I'm aware of the things that you sent me, which I thought right. were, were just fantastic. And inside of that, there's a recurring theme of, of this um, interest of yours that connects reading with, that connects reading with this uh, disparity in opportunity mm -hmm. and this disparity of readiness to go into school um, that uh, connects with the, the, the broad brush of Coleman that, mm -hmm. that's, that's trying to build this kind of case for, we've got to focus differently here. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could say something about how, just in your own mind, how you've shifted to your purpose today in that kind of work. Okay. And then we can drill into some of the details of that. Sure, that's great. Um, well, I'm a sociologist, and my in professional interest is in inequality. And inequality is one of the great themes of the field of sociology. And sociologists um, attack the question from a lot of dimensions. Um, they'll look at schools, they'll look at the labor market. Um, they will look at race inequality and social class and gender inequality. Um, what I came to realize as I thought about it and looked at data and pursued this question of school performance was that school performance is highly correlated over time. And what people who do research in the area know is that test scores are really very reliable. And if you know someone's test scores from one year, you can predict their test scores for a future year very well. So the natural question seemed to me that since everybody was concerned with um, inequality in achievement, and since occupational achievement requires you to go to college and get a high-level degree, and since you have to do well in high school to go to college, and since it seemed reasonable that to do well in high school, you had to do well in middle and elementary school, the logical strategy was to follow it back in time. And I then realized that while sociologists had done this, um, they have not particularly followed it all the way back, that for a variety of reasons, some of them being just the availability of data. Sociologists rarely looked with much detail before high school. And of course, I was thinking that you need to take it all the way back to where school begins. So that would be kindergarten or first grade. And, and that's what I had been working with in the tutoring program for kids reading. Because the answer that immediately came up when you asked where does all this happen is it happens in first grade. Um, so I have been focusing my studies on preschool and early elementary school. 
And I'm not the only one doing this, and the, the idea that this is important seems to have occurred to a lot of people at about the same time. It may be at least partly because this focus on reading came from the federal administration. But um, suddenly, for the first time, as, as far as I'm aware, in the history of the world, um, a very large data set was created of children entering kindergarten. And the National Center for Education Statistics in the Department of Education created the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study. And they went and got data on 20,000 children, a representative national sample of kids entering kindergarten in 1998. And they collected all the information about those kids and their families that we are used to have collected for high school kids. So for the first time, we had that kind of data. And when I'm resting, I do applied statistics. And so I need a big data set. And um, this data is sort of perfect for that. So I and others have been analyzing these data. And there are some other data sets that I had also analyzed and others have. But the bottom line is a kind of stunning conclusion, which is that these inequalities that everybody knows about and talks about are in fact present when kids enter kindergarten. And in fact, in a paper I wrote, you can show that they are present in oral vocabulary at 36 months of age, which is the youngest that many people give one of these standardized uh, tests called the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, where you show the kid pictures of things that get increasingly more complex, and you ask them, what is this? And so it's all oral, and these vocabulary differences are already present at 36 months, and then, of course, you discover there's always been somebody before you, and um, these wonderful people, Hart and Risley, had... Um, written a book in 1995 in which they reported on essentially the same finding. And so I was able to kind of correlate their results with my results, and they match perfectly, which is that social class um, of the parents, the educational level of the parents, predicts the oral vocabulary that they give to their children in preschool. And that oral vocabulary, along with other things, um, the mental stimulation of asking kids a lot of questions and telling them a lot of things and getting the kids to talk a lot and use their vocabulary, um, and standard speech and syntax and grammar, and a certain amount of an explicit or implicit instruction um, in... Um, what words mean, uh, but also what the numbers are and teaching of things like numbers, um, occurs in the first five years of life. And since we seem to be learning that the brain learns more in that period than in any other period, um, and five years is a long time, these incredible inequalities are created before school starts. And that is, in fact, consistent with Coleman's and other sociology of education researchers, which seems to suggest that schools are not really the major force, it's families. And schools are simply get the inequality that comes to them. And actually, the studies seem to now be suggesting that schools reduce it slightly. But that's about the entire process. Um, by the way, we usually talk about vocabulary, and I know you're focused on reading, but one of the perhaps surprising findings out of this data set and this research is that the gaps are just as large in pre-mathematics. And so um, it's not just a reading story. There's exactly a um, parallel story for mathematics. And I think you know this, but um, you know that all of the other discussions, such as phonics versus whole language, has a mathematics side. There is a, uh, a kind of whole math side called constructivist mathematics, where people want to teach kids to discover the math themselves rather than drilling them on, say, their multiplication tables. And so the, there really seems to be a complete parallel between the verbal and reading side on the one hand and the math instruction and later math preparation and then later math instruction on the other. <clears throat>
That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, let's back up and come into that uh, a couple of different ways. I'll give you a, just an overview of what I would like to go into some more. I'd like you to do a summary of Coleman. Okay. Just kind of nail that so that he's not coming with the same data set you are. He's right. chopping at a gross level 30 years ago or whatever it is. Okay. And, and so he's got a different methodology and like a real quick kind of boom. This is what he was about. Okay. This is what he discovered. Okay. Then relative to the uh, oral language piece, you you posited or mentioned a correspondence between their level of education and the vocabulary they impart. Right. And then went on to modify that. Right. Okay. And um, one of the things that's striking about Hart Risley's work is they're saying, look, um, that the there's two pieces. Stanovich's work on what builds vocabulary, mm -hmm. that vocabulary is built independent of education. It's, it's basically based on reading. Mm -hmm. How much of a reading somebody does predicts or defines their vocabulary field and scope much more than their education, which is one vector in here. And another is that it's the, um, uh, it's the degree of talk and kind of talk that's mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. that Hart and Risley found Mm -hmm. that's independent, uh, well, it's grossly correlated, roughly correlated, mm -hmm. that parents that were taciturn, that were wealthy and well-educated, mm -hmm. even though they're rarer, mm -hmm. um, produced children that were as uh, impoverished in vocabulary as, uh, you know, people from lower SES standings mm -hmm. um, that had similar talk behaviors. So mm -hmm. it was the talk behavior more than education per se or more than socioeconomic status per se mm -hmm that was responsible for the development of this kind of deep intelligence, mm -hmm. verbal intelligence, mm -hmm. which spreads into these other dimensions. Mm -hmm. So any one of those things you want to pick on, and we'll, we'll okay. unpack them some more. Okay. Um, James Coleman is considered one of the greatest sociologists of this time period. And... Um, Sociology doesn't have the strongest reputation as a science. Um, sometimes it's more a butt of jokes. And uh, those of us in the field would like to find where is the strong science in sociology. And, you know, the mark of a true science is that people create findings that really surprise them and that were not obvious, were not expected, and dealing with them requires the field to change and grow. That's what a real science does. Uh, Kuhn's paradigmatic shift. Right. And, you know, the example I like is um, when Einstein pointed out that you got the same speed of light whether you were going with it or going against it, and that if you simply worked the arithmetic of what that required, you would get a whole new kind of physics. Um, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. And perhaps the only case where that has occurred in, in the history of sociology, as discussed by um, Moynihan in his obituary of Coleman, was when Coleman conducted his famous study in 1968 called Equality of Educational Opportunity, where he got data on performance of students across a, a large number of high schools all throughout the U.S. with thousands of cases to study, and discovered that school effects were very small and family effects were very big and that um, if you looked at what explained variation, um, most of the variation is for different individuals within the same school rather than for the same individual across different schools. And there's a whole statistical breakdown of these things, but the bottom line is that at most 20% of variation could be attributed to differences across schools, whereas 80%, the remaining 80%, is due to individuals and their families. So, so just take that one point and let's kind of nail it. Uh, what you're saying is, is that um, 
eighty percent in the variation of student performance as mm -hmm. measured by these tests right. is reflecting variations in their home environments, not variations in their school. That's right. right. So could you, in your words, then, but right. that kind of boom. <laughs> right. Um, there's a, a, a mathematical decomposition of variance. It's called analysis of variance. And you analyze it. You, you take the total amount that kids differ on their test scores, and you can break it down into the part that's due to the kid and their families and the part that's due to the school they attend. And you can think of the mental experiment of if you stayed in one school and moved from, let's say, sort of the high end of the kids to the low end of the kids, how much would their scores change? Versus an experiment in which you take a kid and then you move him to different schools and because people do better in that school, it might raise him or lower him. And so then you ask, how much change is due to the school you're in and how much is due to yourself and your family? And the answer is it's overwhelmingly yourself and your family. And this was not what was expected. It was, to many people, it's counterintuitive. Um, people, sociologists and educators, ha were not anxious to hear this. Um, it appears to say that schools are not important. And because it appears to say that, people have argued over it for 30 years. And a lot of people have retested it. And over and over and over again, they get the same finding. And all of these very highly motivated people have never been able to shake that finding. And so um, it's well established. People have a, an aversion to it in the sense that what it's saying is, is that, that um, schools represent a hope of having some ability to change what otherwise has been this intractable trajectory coming mm -hmm. out of the homes. That there right. is, it's, a, it's a rudder right. on the ship that otherwise right. is running down the family track. Right. And in such a controversial area, you have to be very careful about what you say. Um, I'm not saying that the finding says that schools have no effect. I'm saying that most of the effect in the world we live in, with the kind of schools and the kind of kids and the kind of families we have, is due to the families. In fact, there's a stronger version of this, which is even less palatable to most people, which is that if you take the part that's due to the schools and you try to figure out what is it about schools that explains the part that schools can explain, it is not most of the things that people normally think about or that, in fact, most of the things we spend money on. So it turns out that um, schools that have high tax rates um, often spend that money on building a better building, putting more books in the library, uh, having nicer playing fields. And Coleman and others actually tested all these different features statistically to see what the effect of each of them was. And most of the ones I just mentioned, the ones that are the most obvious manifestations of school expenditures, have no effect. And that's almost hard to believe, given that in the popular mind, Jonathan Kozel is talking about not much money spent on poor schools, and places like Texas are having these enormous battles over Robin Hood funding, and school funding, and school tax rates are a constant source of discussion. So it's really anomalous that the profession has learned one thing, and the rest of the country merrily goes on its way worrying about these other things. Um, Really, you could spend hours just on this issue this is alone. Work on right. Class size. Right. 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 And I, I did want to say that the natural follow up question, I think, is well, what is it about schools that makes the biggest effect so far as we know? And the answer seems to be the quality of the teacher. And we seem to be able to show, although even here, for something so important, the evidence is on the weak side, but we seem to be able to show that some teachers are generally good in the sense that their students gain more, and others are generally not so good. There's also some evidence that this is related to the teacher's own test score. 
And it is certainly reasonable that school districts that pay higher salaries, which is something they do with money, end up recruiting smarter teachers and or more experienced teachers. And there is some evidence that more experienced teachers do better. Um, so it may be that money works via the mechanism of recruiting better teachers. But the overall finding still stands that um, a, a school intervention is in general operating on only about 20% of the variation, whereas a family intervention would be operating on 80% of the variation. So you can see why people take it back to the family, take it back to preschool, take it back to things that will have a, a stronger impact closer to the kid. Um, just to close this one point, there was a book uh, put out by the Hoover Institute in mm -hmm. which a chapter written by a Harvard economist. Carolyn Hoxby. I don't know if it was Carolyn Hoxby. It may have been. I know, I know of her work. Too. Right. Um, but this was, she would be a good person, a great person so to much. interview. Right. I'm sorry. If family matters so much. Right. Um, why are schools important or something like right. that? Right. And in it... <clears throat> She basically said that, according to the information that we have, mm -hmm. this was two years old, two, two years ago, right. that a 5% change in family effect mm -hmm. would be more positive mm -hmm. than a 70% change hmm. in school effect, hmm. right? right. Or, in our, or another way that she came around it was somewhere between 11 and 14 times more significantly mm -hmm. influential. Right. Well, I don't know about those exact numbers, but that general point is consistent with what I'm saying. And so I, I found right. like five or six people working in different areas. Now, right. they all come to teacher quality. That's where right. six come. They right. all convert. Right. So teacher, right? Right. You go talk to Richard Allington. Richard Allington is currently president of the International Reading Association. Mm -hmm. We him in Knoxville. Right. And one of his things before he got onto his, he's a whole language professor. I know he is. We were wrestling on that. Stuff. Right. Before we got to that, though, um, he conducted one of the largest scale uh, studies of what makes good teachers. Uh huh. Right? And to listen to him describe what makes a good teacher mm -hmm. is to is almost word for word identical to listening to um, Todd Risley talk about what makes a parent right. successful in bringing out the auditory language. Right. Child. Right. That it had to do with a quality of engagement the mm -hmm. degree to which that they were talking with and calling forth talk right. rather than uh, broadcasting. Right. And the person who's tried to take that back to preschool is Russ Whitehurst with his idea of dialogic reading. So engagement with the kid and getting the kid to learn by doing is the effective thing. And the hard part is a teacher with 22 kids can't easily engage each of them that way. And so, once again, it seems as though the school is a somewhat blunt instrument to try to work through. But how does, the, how does it work while it's so difficult with 22 kids when the arguments about the class size seem to keep washing out to have little effect? That's a good, that's, that, I've thought, I've wondered about that myself. Um, ah, okay. Right. I, I think the answer, well, I think the answer on class size, which is another one of these important issues that you would think we ought to be able to get them settled. I mean, if this were epidemiology and we were doing a drug for an epidemic, you'd think we wouldn't allow these things to stay unresolved. But um, so really the very large issue is the quality um, of the scientific work and the large amount of politics that seems to drown the attempt to do evidence and science. But um, I think the answer in this, my own answer that I have come to in this, in this case for myself is that class size, large class size hurts you when you get above 25 or 28. And you can actually see that in ECLS data. I had a student do an analysis of that. Um, class size doesn't help. Class size between 14 and 25 um, doesn't make that much difference 
it, that's my theory. I'm telling you what I think is the answer. Because basically, once you get above 14, the ability to engage individual students is so reduced that the difference between 14 and 25 just is not that important. Teachers have to switch modes right. to a different mode of distributing themselves. Right. They can as right. Thresholds. Right. Now, I actually believe that class size below 14 does help. And I think uh, an old PhD student of mine had some findings that supported that. But in the real world, you don't see those small class sizes very much, although you do see them in private schools. But that's not in large, well-known data sets. And to my knowledge, nobody's really gone looking for this. It's too far outside the realm of practical application. Right. Although, actually, I don't believe that's true. Um, I just believe it's true in the current world. Be, right. Well, you know, our history was that personally we ended up sort of by accident sending our son to a private school in Dallas. And that private school had 10 to 12 kids per class. And my son had a very good experience where when he finally re-entered public school in state college in this very high performing school district, um, he was a full year ahead of this very high performing public school district. And that was really unusual because he's not particularly a brilliant kid. And um, I really think it was what that school did. And when he was going to that school, the school was at times in danger of going out of business. And we used to worry about it. And I used to sit there and calculate the costs. And what you realize is that even in a moderate priced private school, which at that time in Dallas was $6,000 a year per kid, um, the cost for assembling a class of 10 kids would be the parents would be paying $60,000. Now, it turns out that in those kind of private schools, very good teachers will take a lower salary because of the pleasure of working there. And everybody who knows private schools knows that fact. So it's not really in question very much. So literally, the teachers that were teaching David, who were superb, were being paid about $30,000. This was 15 years ago. So actually, the school was taking in um, $60,000, dollars $80,000, paying the teacher $30,000, using the remaining $50,000 for the buildings and the principal and all of that. And it was really pretty financially viable. Yeah. And in fact, it made me think, in now in the world of homeschooling, just thinking outside the box, that if four parents got together, they could each put up $5,000 and they could do the class in their home with one of them hired as the teacher for $20,000 or somebody else hired as the teacher for $20,000. And you can have four in a class. And I honestly believe, therefore, that the economics of schools, where, as you know, in Washington, D.C., uh, one, has one of the highest uh, pay per teacher in the country, something like twelve to $14,000 per student. And their performance is so low that it is just embarrassing. I mean, it, the, the, the student's growth is zero. Um, so you do wonder whether, as with the fall of communism, um, this might not be one of these great issues that everybody says you can't do anything about, but that, in fact, if there was an institutional way to rethink it, could be radically revised to be much more effective. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, the way the recycling argument crossed a certain threshold of becoming institutionally convenient right. enough to tip everybody. To right. You know, the, this, is, this is the part where um, immediately when you start talking about these kind of issues, right. it's the immediate, we don't even go there. It's right. Like, nope. Right. Class size too big. Right. Th which is stopping us from even That's right. the level of thinking about, well, how, will, how would we read That's it? right. And, and another feature of this, and once again, that's why I say the real, you know, what you're doing is so important because this is really about thinking and rethinking things that are right in front of your face. Um, the, if this were physics, any anomaly, anything that stood out, a hundred smart people all over the world would jump on it and they would argue it out and what was true would come out and then people would act on it and pretty soon you'd have a technology that exploited it like the laser. 
Um, here, these anomalies just get brushed aside as politically unacceptable to talk about, and they persist year after year. How do Asian kids, many, in many cases from families with very low educational levels, come to elementary school performing higher than standard white American kids from middle class families? What is that? Could you bottle that? What is it those people are doing? Um, another anomaly is the high performance of homeschoolers. Everybody knows that all the studies of homeschooling show that the kids can do 12 years of homeschooling. They spend about half the amount of time on, on instruction as the kids in regular schools, and almost inevitably they score higher on tests and go to college and do fabulously. So there are these anomalies, that, like the Coleman anomaly, that persist and that just get brushed aside. Now, the other thing was the um, oral language. Right. Do you still want to do that? Yeah, I definitely want to do that. Um, it seems that, that when we talk about school effects, family effects, that we can kind of double click inside of that and get mm -hmm. at well, what is it that's inside family effects that's, right. that's, that's creating the big effects. Right. And um, what you've done, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which is where, where we want to go with this, really connect the dots between mm -hmm. the Hart and Risley work on one level, your work on another level, uh, Patricia Cool and other people that are working on what is it that develops. Uh, auditory discrimination, mm -hmm. how does that predict speech development, mm -hmm. how does that predict vocabulary acquisition. Mm -hmm. so there's this great convergence. Going right. On, right. So I want to speak to how is it that you go, you, as you start, as you said earlier, okay, I, I start with college, I go back to high school, I go mm -hmm. back from there to elementary school, it, clearly the differences are, are there before they come in. Right. Um, what is accounting for those differences? Right. And you have... Um, gone through the, uh, the the data set you were describing earlier, mm -hmm. some one of the attributes in there has to do with auditory processing. Performance. Right, so right. Can you explain a little bit about that and give me a, a broad view of how auditory processing connects through the data to reveal itself as being so fundamental. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a short version, kind of, you know, a soundbite clip version mm -hmm. of that that I can use both. Okay. Um, well... One of the areas where we have really learned things in the last 20 or 30 years is how children learn to read. And we have learned that um, speech is a sound stream and the sound units in the, in the speech stream uh, can be called phonemes. And to hear the separate words in the sound stream your ear needs to be attuned to the language. So when I listen to a language I don't know, like Russian, it often sounds like it all rolls together. Um, the better your oral language knowledge, the more likely you are to be able to both hear the separate words and hear the sounds that make up those words and put those words together to extract their meaning. There is something similar on the written side. Um, our written down language comes in words and the words come in letters and you, what you really do when you read is you decode the sequence of words and the way you do that is by looking at the separate letters and thinking of the sounds and running the sounds together and making the words and when you hear the words your oral vocabulary knows their meaning and you assemble the meaning of what you're reading. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sounds that are spoken and the letter group representation of those sounds and when we either spell, take a spelling test, where somebody um, says a word and we have to tell you the letters, which means we have to think of the sounds and then link the letters to them and say out the letters, or the opposite, when you read, which is that you look at the letters, think of the sounds they make, hear the words, 
and listen to the meaning and assemble the meaning, when you do that, you're going back and forth between the letters and the sounds. And so it is the ability to access the separate phonemes in spoken language and relate them to the written down um, symbols that, that code up the sounds that is involved in reading. Um, the research has come to understand that and therefore emphasized phonemic awareness, which is the simple ability to hear the separate sounds, and auditory processing, which is your ability to manipulate these sounds and, and, and deal with them. Um, a lot of research has gone into, yes? Um. Like, I'll come back to the first part of this, having mm -hmm. to do with the correspondences and what have you later. Mm -hmm. But even at this point, when you say um, uh, process these, your ability to process right. these, we're talking about something that's, that, that's an automatic processing that's almost a priori you, mm -hmm. right? Well, um, it's automatic to adults who are skilled at these things. But, for example, in my tutoring program, we teach phonemic awareness. And a typical exercise is if I say, boy, what's the first sound you hear? For you to answer that question, you have to think to yourself, boy, what sounds do I hear? You have to separate the word, which you automatically, as a young child, already take for granted your ability to speak, and think there's a thing. It's kind of an abstract idea. There's a thing called the first sound. That's what I mean by being able to process it. I mean the ability to focus your mind on it as an object. And so being aware of the first sound versus the last sound, being aware of the first, second, and third sounds so that you can blend them together, those are all the kind of processing I'm talking about. Okay. So there's the individual distinct phonemes, right. elements, right. and then the ability to assemble them together right. in various combinations right. to project a recognizable word sound. Right. Okay. I'm just... okay. 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 All right. So moving back to where you're going. Right. Um, well, where was I going? Well, you're, you're, you're heading down um, the... Uh, oh, the what the leads to early reading. Yes. Well, what the research shows, and it's not really that hard to do this because we have a lot of... A, instruments, uh, ways to measure the performance of preschool children on different dimensions. Um, and this has been developed over a long time. It's not at all problematic. And it's also easy to measure the reading ability of kindergarten or first or second grade children. So it's pretty easy to take a lot of kids and measure them on these different things and then statistically relate them to one another. And so you can ask the question, what is it about preschool kids or kindergarten kids that predicts which of them will be better readers in first grade? And the answer to that is now pretty well known. Um, kids with a better oral vocabulary, that is kids that score higher on a test where you show them pictures of things and say, what is that? Um, kids with better phonemic awareness, that is kids who, if you... Um, say what's the beginning sound of this can tell you successfully, or what's the ending sound of this can tell you. Um, kids who know all their letters and know their letter sound correspondence. In other words, there's 26 lowercase and 26 uppercase letters, and it is easy to show them to a beginning kindergartner and say, point to each letter and tell me the name of the letter and the sound it makes. And some kids will score rather high on that. Other kids will hardly be able to do more than one or two. And that also is very predictive of who will be a better reader later. Um, so at least those three things, I forget if I'm leaving anything out, but um, uh, phonemic awareness, um, oral vocabulary, and letter sound knowledge are certainly very powerful predictors. And if you have that information for each child, using all three of those pieces of information, you can predict with pretty great accuracy 
which of them will become better readers in first grade. So there really isn't a lot of um, mystery about this. Um, we also have learned that the educational level of the parents tends to predict these preschool characteristics pretty strongly. And people like Hart and Risley have demonstrated that between 12 months of age, when many kids uh, begin to speak their first words, and 36 months of age, when most kids fully enter the family conversation and are treated like real members of the conversational entity rather than as beginning speakers who have to be helped along, that between 12 and 36 months, basically, the kids learn to talk the way their parents do. And they learn the vocabulary, they learn the grammar and syntax, and they use their minds with the language to deal with the real world in the same way their parents do. And so it appears as though that is how social class and parental educational skills are transmitted. Um, and from 36 months to five years is where these further things develop and that then leads to early reading and that then leads to the rest of school success. Okay, thank you. Can we back up. Uh, you know, there was something I wanted to say as I was just finishing that. If I could just try to find what my what my thought was. Um, the, what the, oh, yes, I did want to um, just talk from personal experience for a minute. And um, it's almost a joke for a statistician who likes to have a big data set and observations on thousands of children to use his own kid as, as, as the evidence when it's just one case. But sometimes a dramatic case helps to convince you of something. And it's certainly the case that people who really want to be convinced of things usually want some sort of experiment. And the kind of experiment they're often interested in it is things like adoption, where um, the, the adoptive parent is different than the birth parent, and you can separate nature and nurture and things like that. And just by accident, we have one such case, which is that our son is African-American, and he was born to a 13-year-old seventh grade mother who um, lived in a low-income area in a Texas city. And um, as a male African-American from that background, all the statistics in the world would tell you what his average performance le uh, level would be on these outcomes later. And the variation around that average performance is not that large. And so you can be relatively confident about within what range he would have been performing. But we adopted him, and we did our parenting thing with him. And as a result, he has scored at the 96th percentile on oral vocabulary his whole life. And, you know, this isn't the 60th percentile even, or the 65th percentile. This is the, something like the 96th percentile. And it continues to stand out by comparison with, let's say, his other performance, which is slightly above average in the country, but otherwise nothing extraordinary. Um, and it also speaks to this question of, does it come with oral language or with reading? Because try as we might um, and work on it as we couldn't help ourselves but doing, we were never able to have a big effect on his love of reading. He's all boy and he loves sports and he doesn't particularly love reading. And every Friday for most of our life, as he was growing up, we went to a bookstore because that's what we like to do. And we bought him anything he wanted to buy and we often bought him lots of stuff. But in the end, he still to this day does not like to read. Um, he does it when he has to do it for schoolwork and he performs fine on it. But nobody would consider him a star reader. If anything, he reads a little bit slower than average. Um, the one thing that has stood out for him always has been his vocabulary, 
which has been way at the top of the charts. And it has helped him a lot. It helps him write. It helps him read. When he does read, even though he doesn't like to do it that much, he knows the words he encounters. So I do feel that knowing David and observing the effect of this intervention we've sort of been involved in has helped support some of the things I've seen and also shown some of the limits of these forces that we've talked about. It's certainly um, one dimension of this vocabulary. We don't currently have a very good index for um, fluency in oral vocabulary, the speed with which we're able to creatively apply the vocabulary that we have in, our, in expressing ourselves, for example. Just going back to your, mm -hmm. to your personal experience, right. was, the, was there a, a noticeable difference or anything interesting about the um, scope of vocabulary on the one hand and the uh, speed and dexterity of expression? Okay. Well, and what I, th what I believe is, and it's not based on a designed study, but what I believe is that the way it works is that you have instant access to your vocabulary and he doesn't hesitate in, in knowing whether he knows a given word or not. And often over dinner, I'll say something and he'll say, I don't know what that is. And then I'll just define the word for him. But once he knows what it is, he will bring it up instantly if it arises. Um, it has had no effect on his speech or his reading, in my view. That is to say, um, he stuttered a little bit as a child. He got over it. We worked very carefully with it. He's always been a man of few words. He really does not like to talk very much, at least with us. He d seems to talk with his, with his friends and things. But he will use the smallest number of words necessary to answer you. Now, a lot of teenagers do that. But he certainly, ne he has al always been the opposite of verbal. And um, everybody who, adult who knows him, would, would agree with that. Um, he has always read a little bit on the slow side. I think that that was less noticeable when he was younger, when speed was less of an issue. But now that he's in high school with kids, some of whom are very fluent, and where the classes assign a great deal of reading, we often hit the situation that um, if he was assigned in, in Honors English, which he was in for a fairly long time until we finally said, okay, you've done enough, you don't have to do that anymore. But they would assign, you know, five chapters of A Tale of Two Cities to read in one night. And he could read it just fine, but he would move at a slow pace. And the only way he could get the assignment done with all the other homework is that often he and my wife would sit on the couch and they would take turns reading chapters to one another so that her extra speed would help get through the, the thing. And the fact that she was doing it faster would help inspire him to kind of hit his fast rate. But basically, he reads slowly. It seems to be unaffected by his vocabulary, although you could imagine that if his vocabulary were any worse, he would really have a problem. Um, it just seems like vocabulary is sui generis. I, I don't know that that's consistent with other people's ideas, but it's what I've seen. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, um, By the way, we've done a lot of work on the math side. And on the math side, um, he's sort of less talent than he has on the English side. I think perhaps because there isn't something like vocabulary. He's always been very shy. Um, he's not shy in his presentation of self now. He's overcome that, and he's actually an enormously popular kid. Um, but he is still what you might call cautious. I, the story I like to tell is that when we would go to meetings where there were a lot of parents and kids when he was like five years old, he, you know, the kids sit on the parents' lap, and then eventually the kids go and play together. And he would be literally the last one out of 20 kids to leave my lap. He's always been very cautious. Um, so, anyway, that's... Well, yeah. yeah, I think this is fascinating. And mm -hmm. uh, I want to come back to some of the other questions, but I don't want right. to just leave this. I think this mm -hmm. is really 
a beautiful story, mm-hmm. and it's great. I also have been moved by not only um, the kind of research out in the world, right. but but somehow being first person brought right into it right. in my own life, right. so that it's not just out there. Right. It's not just something at a distance. Right. No, it's real people. It. It's, it's real, real people. Stuff. Yeah. Right. And that the, that there. It's not that you can overgeneralize from your personal sample of reality. Right. right. But you can't make meaning out of that other if you don't right. have it either. Right. I'm actually interested in in hearing you say that one of, some of your kids might have had a problem with these issues because my experience is that I have often. Ever since I've been into this phonics versus whole language, I have often run into parents, middle class parents, whose kids had some problem and say were damaged by whole language or something. They often become almost obsessed with this issue and very focused on it. And because they cared so much and watched so closely and tried so hard with the kid, they are grounded in the reality of it in ways that people like Allington are not. And people like Allen, I, I have a very low opinion of Allington. Uh, people like Allen, I was his discussant at a conference on whole language versus phonics once. So, um, But these people have a theory and they have, n- uh, th- either they have very little experience with real children or they have a great capacity to miss what goes on with real children. Even with my own Penn State students who I train as reading tutors, I've had a number of them who said they had a brother who had a reading problem or a speech problem, and that attuned them to whole language versus phonics, and so they feel very strongly about it, and they then observe that the kids they are tutoring have already been damaged by being told to guess words, which is, you, you got to strip down what whole language is saying. That's what they're saying. They're just saying guess words. Either guess it from the pictures or guess it from the first letter. And that's just bad advice. And so you're giving someone a bad, you know, it's sort of like saying, now the way you hit a baseball is first you close your eyes. Well, you could do a lot of damage that way. No question. And, and my sense is, is that both of these things are, are uh, crude, superficial approximations that, um, like in, in so many fields, that mm-hmm. you know, these polarities come out so that we can right. differentiate between them into something else, which then right. splits into <laughs> sure. polarities so that we differentiate. That's right. No, that the world is pretty further, compli- further, complex. And that uh, both of these things are, uh, again, over, over simplistic approximations. Mm-hmm. And it depends on where the child is. I mean, Reed Lyon himself, you know, who's the czar of this right. business, so to speak, and certainly one of the staunch proponents of phonics would, would say that ch- the ch- children that are prepared well, mm-hmm. who have the kind of robust o- or oral language skills, right. who have the, you uh, know, in, in our language might say emotional self-regulation, they have a mm-hmm. threshold of uh, emotional tolerance for frustration before right. they shame out, right. which is a big piece here. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes, it is. Um, <clears throat> that, beca- that people that come ready, man, just about any way you teach them, they're gonna, it's going to work. Right, right. Right? The less ready they are, the more that they depend on us being very systematic. Right. Right? right. But then we say, well, when we say uh, systematic in terms of applying this model of phonics or that model of phonics, mm-hmm. um, we're still not meeting them on the edge that they're actually experiencing the confusion. We're right. still taking a statistical probabilistic right. stairway and saying climate. Right. No, and that's why, and I, I agree with you so much about that. That's why I have said, I've done in-service training for teachers. And when you do this, the thing that teachers immediately start talking about, because they're very practical people, because they live in a very practical world, they immediately start talking about different uh, sets of books and different publishers' sets of books and which curriculum they're using with the kid. And I remember trying to get to the essence of it, and I said to them, remember that the curriculum that the kid experiences is literally what you put in front of him and ask him to do. And that may bear very little resemblance to the puffery of the people who wrote the materials or what they say the materials do or what you think in your mind the materials are due. Or what order that somebody's prescribed that they should receive these right. things as distinct right. from... You know, right. Ultimately, we talk about... The, the, my favorite analogy is... is the little baby who's right on the edge of walking. I mean, you right. just you just want to offer them the, the fingertips. I mean, right. You don't want to walk for them. Right. Right. You want to just right. help them have a little bit 
of uh, you know secure bubble to differentiate in as they extend themselves in the mastery. If you're going to mess with them at all, right? Right. So the thing is to get very concrete and look very closely at what the kid can do and what is the next thing the kid is being asked to do, and to make that as easy to accomplish as possible. Right, and this can this can lead right down the pipe to direct instruction on the one. Right, right, right. Which, I mean. <laughs> So Fred Engelman could be sitting in that chair and right. have said the same statement. Right. And I'm not so sure that that's what you mean. Well, right. <laughs> but of course, direct, Engelman's direct instruction had this invented um, spelling that may not be the best intermediary for getting the kid to read successfully. So he sort of in, had a bright idea and then imposed it. Um, the, the idea being uh, make, make each step something that they're 95% ready to do. Right. Right. De decrease extraneous uh, ambiguities right. and confusions right. so that they have right. a high likelihood of right. success at each step. Don't create a field of, of uh, alternative uh, things that they can get lost in. Right. right. And, and I do think we all agree on that. Um, you might not want. You might want to do it with the usual materials they will encounter with the ordinary letters and ordinary books, um, but. I still think that's the best possible advice. Um, the, uh, if we rewind earlier into the conversation, we were talking about the two different systems, the auditory processing right. circuitry and uh, the phonemic uh, awareness or phonemic mm -hmm. differentiation into the, the, the sound system. Right. And then the letters and how they correlate to sound. Mm -hmm. All right. One of the things that's really clear is, is that the kind of uh, differentiation that the brain has to make in order to be able to differentiate words mm -hmm. in the oral soundscape that a child's developing in mm -hmm. is of a different order and granularity than the kind of differentiation in sound that has to be done in order to map it to these letters. Okay. Right? Right. <laughs> it's a different thing. They're related. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But they're but it's it's different. In other words, uh, just like you said, some kids they could say "boy," mm -hmm. but right. they couldn't necessarily say, right. break it down. Right. Well, so they were able to say "boy." They know what it means. Right. So they're capable of processing the phonemic features right. of it orally. Right. But they don't have to become conscious of it. Right. And it, they don't and, have to make artificial distinctions in it. Right. And and and, and this it. seems to go with the observation that we our brains seem to be programmed for oral language so that at all times in history and in all places in the world babies grow up and learn to speak without a whole lot of difficulty. But in most times in history and many places in the world no, but uh, kids grow up and don't learn to read. So it is not a natural thing to learn to read. And apparently a feature along the way is the ability to um, deal with sounds as units and to manipulate them and to link them to the written down letters. Right, right. So what I'm trying to do is bring us back to that auditory okay. conversation in a way that's also a dialogue between us, okay. which, which I enjoyed on the phone and I enjoy right. when we're together. Okay. Um, and say that the way that I like to think about this that's helped me is to think of the player piano, mm -hmm. right? If you don't have the right number of keys right. or they can't play at the right speed together, mm -hmm. no matter what's going on in the scroll, it's not going to sound right. Right. Right? Right. And so um, there's a d development of vo vocabulary um, it is exercising not only the buildup of vocabulary knowledge, but it is what's exercising the differentiation, mm -hmm. speed-wise mm -hmm. and number-wise, of building up the phonemic awareness engine, so to speak, that later can map to print. Okay, although I'm not sure I agree with where I see you going with that. Okay, where do you, where do you say I go? <laughs> okay. Um, I've been interested in how you could reduce inequalities. Mm -hmm. And I have an idea of how it could be done practically that I think has not been taken up enough. And that idea is that, you know, it's all relative. Um, the problem is that lower income kids fall behind the curriculum that's expected, the performance that the teacher expects, the performance that the higher income kids can do, and that leads to the negative social psych feedback that you've mentioned. Um, 
there's something a little bit arbitrary about that. I mean, if in our schools we didn't teach the middle class kids to read until second grade, then nobody would have to read until second grade. Well, I mean, it's arbitrary in the sense that the whole reading thing's arbitrary. That's right. That's and right. Cultural. So, if we so let's a, right. So let's course, take that idea, yeah. and I'm looking for a place where the um, lower income kids can be helped to steal a march on the stronger army of the middle class kids. And my view is that that place is kindergarten. Um, because middle class families, and in particular people overly impressed with a sometimes less than fully scientific notion of readiness, who often are in ed schools, um, because the middle class families and more particularly these ed school people have decided that you really can't learn to read until first grade, middle class kids in general don't learn to read until first grade. So instead of lower class kids always being behind them, I believe there's the opportunity to actually start to teach the lower class kids to read in kindergarten. And I'm getting a long way around to my point, but here it comes. And that is that um, the question arises, could you teach lower class kids to read in kindergarten? And if so, what would be the, if, if not, what would be the impediments in, in doing so? And that gets to your question I heard you raise of what are the real essentials to learn to read? And I have had the opportunity to try to do that. I have been able to take experienced tutors from my program, and there was a charter school in Dallas, and they wanted to try this experiment. And the way we did it was that we took the most developmentally ready, developmental readiness is real, it's just that where, what level it's at at different ages might be different according to different experts you talk to. We took those kids and we, the kindergarten teacher gave us the four kindergarten kids who in September were the most developmentally ready to learn to read. And the tutor pulled them out of the class for 15 minutes a day, every day. And what she did with them is she took these very simple Bob books and very simple words and um, a small number of letters like M, A, T, and S. So you can make words like Matt, Sat, Matt, Sat, Sam and worked with them on the at the blackboard to sound out the letters, to string them together into words, to read the resulting words. And the answer is that in about a month and a half, she had them all reading, actually reading independently. So you could give them more books and they would read them themselves. And they were then left in the classroom and other kids were picked. And by taking four kids who were the next ready ones through the year of kindergarten, she was able to get them all reading by the end of kindergarten. Now, where the point I, I'm making is that the kids' vocabulary was not the issue. They were, we were trying to get them the idea of reading which is sounding out a few simple letters and sounds. As I said, even the lowest performing low-income kids usually know a few letters when they start kindergarten. So the issue is not their knowledge of letters, nor is it their knowledge of vocabulary, because they all know more words than Matt, Sat, Sam. None of them have any trouble. Their oral vocabulary is way beyond that. They're ordinary kids who can talk. The issue is their phonemic awareness and their ability to manipulate the sounds, sound out, and get the idea of what you're doing when you sound out. And that is a question of developmental readiness, and I suppose it might be driven by the family's vocabulary with the kid, but I tend to doubt it. I think it's really just something that people, that kids vary on in terms of their developmental stage, but that by kindergarten almost anybody could be taught it. So I believe, to summarize, I believe that um, you, that teaching the idea of sounding out is a separate module 
that could be done with anybody at different ages depending upon the quality of your instruction and the level of their readiness to learn it, but that by first grade you could do it with everybody. That that's a separate issue than their vocabulary and grammar. It's mostly an issue of letter sound knowledge and phonemic awareness, that manipulating issue. Um, that yes, of course, um, middle-class children come with a stronger vocabulary, and that does become important when you read more and more, and you read more books and the vocabulary gets bigger, and you can always see kids who have started to read who are having trouble simply because their vocabulary is too weak to support the more and more words they are reading. So I remember working in a school with an African-American boy in Pittsburgh, and he read the word pit, and you could, he could sound it out, but you could tell from his eyes that he didn't know what it meant. And so you realize, wow, there's a lot of words he's going to encounter pretty early that he doesn't know what they mean. But he could read, he would just have trouble with the vocabulary, and you had to push the vocabulary along. So. I hope I'm being clear in saying I think they're separate I, I, I think modules. I think you've right. created the, separate, the, the distinction about the separate modules. And as stated, I don't have any problem with what you're saying, but I right. don't know that, that it's different from what I'm saying. Okay, so well, that's fine then. The, were you able, did you monitor these kids um, from there on through? No, I'm afraid we didn't. Okay. It was catch as catch can. One of the can. things that, right. the things that uh, for example, a recent conversation with uh, Tim uh, Shanahan, Mm -hmm. who is the uh, uh, chairman of the early literacy panel, you know, and was with the uh, mm -hmm. um, national reading panel. Right. Uh, he's been going, pouring over the, you know, the research. He was right. originally opposed to the oral language thing. He said, it doesn't have mm -hmm. that much of a footprint, mm -hmm. particularly not in the first grade and mm -hmm. kindergarten, right. second grade. Right. But it comes boom in the third grade and fourth grade, mm -hmm. right when the right. kids are hitting the wall. Right. Because it's right. at that point where right. these er early instrumental reading things, which are moving slow right. and moving simply, right. um, uh, don't tax right. the, their ability to uh, uh, move to process fast enough. Right. Doesn't tax their background knowledge. Right. Um, to the same degree that the, the, the takeoff ramp right. that's necessary in the third and fourth grade right. does. So the uh, three-year-old's vocabulary has a real strong lock on the third grade, fourth grade takeoff and reading, right. even though it doesn't have a strong correspondence in kindergarten, first grade. Right. I, I agree, and I was thinking along the same lines. Okay. I also think there's a further reason for all this, which is remember that vocabulary is really strongly correlated with parental social class. And remember that the parents are doing a lot. And, you know, I have a graduate student um, and she's studying in this area and she also happens to have a five-year-old boy and she's been interested in the difference between the reading side and the math side. And we have sort of focused on the reading side. And she said to me the other day, you know, um, he asked me to teach him some math, and I discovered that he already knows a lot of math. And I asked him, how did you learn that math? She, she thought that um, he would want her to help him, like, adding five and six, and he said, oh, he's five years old. He said, oh, no, that's baby stuff. I want you to help me adding 45 and 36. And she said, well, how did you get, how did you learn this? That you have, nobody's been teaching you this. And he said, well, um, I saw Daddy doing something with some numbers, and I asked Daddy about it, and he showed me some of this stuff, and then I started working on it. Well, you know, that kid, when you put him in your data set with the others, is going to be the one who has a higher vocabulary. Yeah. Now, is that because he's intrinsically brighter? Is that because his parents do a lot more with him, and, and so yeah, exactly, on? There's a lot exactly. of correlated forces and, and, here. And, and, the, the, and we come back to it. Um, that's why it has to do with engagement and affect, right? Not per se, right? With, um, I mean, Hart Risley said, like it's it's about the number of words, mm -hmm. but implicit in the number of words right. um, is the quality of engagement, right? And that has, in addition to the um, uh, kind of uh, pedagogical modeling or mm -hmm. the uh, call to inquiry that's going right. on. It also has an affective dimension to it. Right. And that when <clears throat> the missing ingredient across the entire spectrum here right. that isn't getting enough attention right. is the affective dimension. Right. What's happening, just as reading itself is this 
faster than conscious right. uh, virtual reality projector system. Right. 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 And the rudiments of mathematics will function in a similar way, although because of the nature of mathematics, one of its important distinctions, they're both code systems. Mm -hmm. They're both ar right. artificial code systems. Right. They're technological inventions. Right. Um, but we can volitionally, intentionally, participatively think about mathematics. Mm -hmm. right? right. In order to get to a point where, where, there's a, where we're past just this uh, crude, simple, beginner, instrumental reading, mm -hmm. where we get to a point where reading is transparent. I mean, we can move through it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's got to become faster than conscious, right? Right. It's got to become automatic. So right. our mind's used to creating these uh, assembled meanings faster than we can be thinking about, than mm -hmm. we're aware about. Mm -hmm. What happens at that level of speed when we develop a feeling level of version mm -hmm. to being confused? Mm -hmm. Because it, we feel shame for the confusion. Right. That the, the confusion evokes a feeling about ourselves that we don't want to have. You right. ever been ashamed of yourself? Yeah. <laughs> you see how right. masterful we are at right. getting out of whatever it is sure. that evokes that? Right. So take that to these autonomic speeds and apply that right. to what's happening to a child. Is their first coming into reading or their first coming into math? Right. Or first coming into speech, right? And the imprint that leaves on the very infrastructure of processing and the career that that has right. thereafter. No, I agree. In fact, um, within sociology, I think I'm one of the few people who has been interested in that as an equally important as an uh, as an equally important feature. Um, so I'm excited that you feel the same way about it. I do. I do. I think that this is. When I talk to the neuroscientists mm -hmm. and the cognitive scientists, they all agree that's right. But that's you know, like, oh, it's, we don't know anything about. You know, the trouble know is, know it's important. it's very subtle, and the, the we don't fully understand it, and we're not good at measuring it because there's different forms of behavior and there's different f uh, sources of behavior. Um, we do have an interest in which part is more manipulable than which other parts. And I think that to get the kind of negative possibilities out on the table also, you've got to deal with the possibility that some kids are brighter or that brightness, as we understand it, is multidimensional and includes a kind of natural interest and enthusiasm for learning or learning these things, so that some of the behavior that you see may almost be an epiphenomenon. In other words, both the learning, the cognitive uh, progress and the learning-related behaviors are both epiphenomenon of relatively deep-seated features of the person. Which could come back to, right. connected with what you just said, with right. a uh, a, a different uh, width of or thickness of threshold mm -hmm. of tolerating right. the frustration and ambiguities right. and right. confusions, right. so that rather than dropping out this, right. at this faster than conscious level and disengaging right. and stuttering the mind right. Right. from being able to continue the processing, right. right, they're able to stay in it longer. Right, just that. Right, right. Right, and we're talking about this is how, this is talking about two, three, four-year-old children are right. developing the infrastructure that's regulating that. Right. Well, and if you're interested in anomalies, which is how science proceeds, you have to realize that here are two that really conflict with one another. On the one hand, an awful lot of our focus has been on cognitive functioning, and you know the data always show that nothing predicts itself later like test scores do. So performance is a very solid real thing. Um, on the other hand, the behavior appears to be important. We all of us say it's 98% perspiration and 2% inspiration and everything. We say that to older people, but it appears that everything is like that. And that makes it sound like it's mostly stick to and focus rather than smartness. So there really is a conflict between the two, and there, that conflict is not resolved in my mind. It's really a little bit paradoxical. So, so, that, so the central question for me is, how, do, how well do we understand the effect of affect on cognition? Right. And we don't. Right. 
I can tell you some negative evidence. Um, Greg Duncan, an economist who you might talk to eventually if you're collecting Heckman-like characters. He's a really nice guy, too. He's at Northwestern. Really, really good. He's the economist who spends most of his time with psychologists, and he works on just the same stuff we're talking about. And in a paper he wrote, which, in which he reported the same findings that I had independently found myself, what he points out is that if you get very good measures of cognitive performance, and learning-related behaviors in, let's say, first grade. And then you use them both to predict cognitive performance and learning-related behaviors in second grade. You will find that it's mostly cognitive performance predicting itself. And the learning-related behaviors from first grade have a rather small positive effect on cognitive performance in second grade once you allow for the very powerful effect of cognitive performance in first grade. Which, which, which comes back to, it seems to me that, that, that that's, that's a positive indication of what happens when you, uh, that so long as the child's inside the domain of um, cognitive performance, meaning that they haven't uh, shamed out, mm -hmm. right? right? That they haven't um, uh, developed a, uh, an aversion to uh, cognitive failure, to cognitive right. confusion right. that's causing them to pull back so that their learning behaviors aren't... And by the way, this connects with um, studies that Lion, have done, Lion has done and others, which is we can do whatever we want to boost up social and emotional um, behavior stuff in children and they're three and four years old doesn't matter if they hit the wall when they're six right. and seven. If it's not reading, related to boom. learning, right, it doesn't it, transcend it's not, it's domains. Not, it not, doesn't go across domains. Right. So, so right. how somebody feels fundamentally right. about their extension right. into learning right. is connected to their performance relative right. to learning right. is a shaping all these other things. Right. And another feature of that is that children are enormously sensitive to the performance of themselves and others and are very hard-nosed realists about assessing that. And if they tell you, I'm below average in this class, there isn't anything you can tell them that will convince them otherwise. Whether or not they're... they're yeah, if they say the other kids are smarter, you can't tell them, oh, that's not true. Well, or what happened with your babysitter. Right. Right? Right. That's the, fir the first concept, but that's, that's also... Um, a shame aversion tactic right? Right. is to downgrade or define right. myself in a way that now ha now mediates against the way I'd right. feel if I didn't. Oh, and it was very explicit. I didn't tell you the whole story. He basically said that he would get himself thrown out of class so he didn't have to read in front of the others. We've got story after story, people breaking their glasses. Right. We have uh, a guy uh, by the name of uh, Richard Lavoie, who is quite famous in the LD mm -hmm. circles. Right. right. Um, with some stories of, of kids that went through, um, who, one kid that, that couldn't read noticed that another kid couldn't read, but the other kid was deaf. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, gosh, if I just play deaf, I won't have to read. <laughs> right. This kid ended up going through exploratory ear surgery. <laughs> right. At six years wow. old. Wow, amazing. The, the, power, the right. power of shame avoidance. Right. We've been collecting stories yes. about this. Yes. It's unbelievable. Yes, yes. And it's very connected to what yes. we're talking about here. That's one expression of this shame aversion yes. happening at a gross level rather than this micro time. Yes level that's, that's disrupting, uh, uh, stuttering up cognition, feeding back on itself right. to, yeah, to right. cancerously uh, right. negatively affect learning. Okay, let me, let me go over, make sure that I've got a few more of my questions that I intended to ask. Okay. Um, Are we at a pausing point? Is yeah, the film like stopped? Break Can I get some water? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, one of the things that I think um, I really want to stress and I'm going to give you a chance to say, you know, here's what we didn't talk about that mm -hmm. you think is important. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure it just gets in there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the general uh, Coleman piece was good. The um, connection of test score predictions. Mm -hmm. We've got people like Whitehurst and others saying this, but I'd like to buttress that coming from a different angle mm -hmm. about the predictions. For example, um, the... 
prediction of uh, one have said that the prediction of uh, you know alphabet knowledge in the first grade mm -hmm. predicts you know reading mm -hmm. in the twelfth grade. Mm -hmm. Uh, auditory processing proficiency mm -hmm. in the first grade predicts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, school performance mm -hmm. throughout. Mm -hmm. What do you know about that level of predictive correlates that you okay. speak to quick, quickly? Okay. Well, you want to, in a real science, you want to state the general truths correctly and boldly, and you also want to qualify them so as not to turn it into a cartoon. Um, in social science, we are always predicting some variables from other variables. And, you know, I teach how to do this to graduate students. It's how you do social science these days. Um, so we have a lot of experience now hundreds of thousands of person hours have been spent using variables to predict other variables. Across all that expanse, you can certainly say that test scores are among the best variables anybody has in terms of their statistical performance. That is to say, they're very regular, um, they don't give wildly varying stories for the same person over time. They have high correlations with things you would expect them to be correlated with. Across the field of social sciences, um, they are the domains where we do best, where we understand best, where things work out most regularly. So somebody coming from outside needs to know that. Just like, you know, if I was interested in surgery, I'd want to know, well, now, which kind of operations are you really good at and which are the ones that you're lucky if you can make them work or something? Well, in the field of social science, then that includes economics and political science and psychology and sociology, the area of statistical work with test scores may be the best area. It's certainly one of the very strongest areas where people know what they're doing, where there are few mysteries, where the results are very regular. And what you find is that from year to year or from one year to two years later, um, test scores and things related to test scores are highly regular and highly predictive. Um, people who score high on math tend to score high on English. People who score high on math one year, score high on math in future years. The strength of these things is far stronger than many other relationships you might have tried to think about, like, say, the relationship between how much education you get and how much money you earn later. We do far better predicting test scores than we do predicting earnings, for example. People's earnings bounces all over the place. Their test scores are very regular. Um, so. We're good at predicting test scores, and we find that test scores predict themselves over time. And we also find, to, to reduce the kind of overstatement, that the more years out you go, the less well it predicts, of course. So you do your first grade test score predicts your third grade a whole lot better than it'll predict your sixth grade, a whole lot better than it'll predict your ninth grade. But it is still pretty remarkable that people have shown that performance in first grade can significantly predict high school dropout, and that there does seem to be a legacy of these things. Um, the really strong effects are in a shorter-term causal chain. In other words, first grade really predicts third and fourth grade quite well. Third and fourth grade predicts seventh and eighth grade quite well. Seventh and eighth grade predicts twelfth grade quite well. Um, trying to do the whole span in one jump, of course, is not as strong. Um, you also find that the variables you might think would be predictive are very predictive. Test scores are highly correlated with the grades you get in courses. The test scores and the grades you get in courses are highly correlated with whether you go to college and what kind of college you go to. Parents' education is highly correlated with all of these other performance measures. Even things that you might have thought would be there, but you'd be kind of not so sure and maybe would wish they wouldn't be there, 
turn out to be there in a very relatively strong way. For example, if you control um, a kid's gender and you control the parent's education and you control a number of other things about the kid and the parents, you will still find that kids that have two biological parents perform better than kids who have a, raised by a single parent. Lots of people would rather not hear that. They would like to say, you know, a single mother raising a kid is trying hard and let's not put her down. And of course, we don't want to put her down, but it is scientifically interesting whether, in fact, after you control a lot of things, perhaps even how much money the family makes, the simple fact of having two parents rather than one is a plus for the kid. And the answer is, statistically, it is. You can put it into a calculation and you will find very reliably that to a reasonable extent, everything else being equal, kids with one parent are getting lower course grades, are having more behavioral problems, are more likely to drop out, are less likely to go to college. And so all of this is a kind of area of investigation where things are pretty well understood and the effects are very regular. Tell me about um, what we know about the uh, effects of reading on education as a whole. Okay. Um, reading and vocabulary, which it's associated with, the whole English domain where things are pretty highly correlated with one another. That is, we're talking about older kids now, I assume. Is that what you want to hear about? Any, anywhere across the spectrum. I mean, okay. I, I'm particularly interested in um, you know, early uh, assessments of how well children are reading and what that says about the probability of their overall education. Right. Process. Well, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely true that kids that, that read at a higher level in early elementary school, do better in school, have higher grades, have higher test scores later, um, will be more successful, will have a lower chance of dropping out, will have higher grades, will go to college. These things are all just part of the evidence about inequality and how it proceeds over time. And the basic answer is um, any difference earlier carries forward through your life. There's an interesting study I've been doing that surprised even me on this score. Um, there are people at the University of Texas I've been working with who analyze data called Ad Health, And it's a big data set that's full of uh, the behavior of adolescents. And we wanted to study their educational performance. And these people have a grant and they went and they got the school records of these high school kids and added it to the data set. And when we got together to study it last summer, I said to them, well, you know, where are the test scores? And they said, well, you know, Ad Health has a problem. It wasn't created by education people and it was never really designed to be used for these purposes. And they only use one test score. It is simply a short version of the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test Score. They call it, instead of the PPVT, the PVT. It's like 10 questions about vocabulary, a very minimal sort of thing about what seems like one narrow domain in performance. And I said, well, let's put it into our calculations. It's one more control variable. Maybe it'll do us some good. Lo and behold, it turned out to be one of the most powerful predictors. It predicted kids' grades. It predicted kids' grades in mathematics. It predicted kids uh, having delinquent activity, early sexual behavior, all kinds of outcomes, both positive and negative, for kids. Um, your vocabulary, your cognitive performance, your ability to sit down at a test and score high just seems to be very predictive of all aspects of life. And it's very regular through life starting at the earliest ages. Um, you talked about uh, family-specific pattern of language use. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very interesting way to put it. I don't know whether you were the first one to put it that way. but. Uh, is there a problem? Well, you know, the light is coming in through the skylights. Yeah, do you want to close that more effectively? I think you can turn it the other way. It might. We're close to wrapping. Okay. It's okay. It's not that 
bad. I was just uh, okay. You were seeing where I was. Are you on pause or are you still rolling? I'm recording. Okay. Um, so it's not it's not bad. I just wanted to see. Okay. That. Uh, <clears throat> Family specific uh, yeah, patterns. Yeah, you were saying before, it, right. it, I think you did a beautiful job of that between the time that they first come in to the time that they right. achieve this kind of threshold of, of, of being a participant in the right. language pattern. Right. right. Um, has anybody else done any work to try to uh, uh, describe these patterns to create some kind of a spectrum of attributes about these patterns? Right, right. No, I think it needs more work. Um, uh, the, the problem is that, that the people who are known for doing it are Hart and Risley. And what they did um, was a labor-intensive project where they had um, graduate students audio taping these conversations. Um, it's not my field. And so I am not up on what others have done since then. I certainly do believe there are other people doing it since then. Um, but I have not been able to find a large-scale study that shows the kind of detailed data they show. But I imagine there are developmental psychologists who could tell us that. It would be interesting if you could find them. Um, I, too, think that this is the key. Um, that what you, you, you described it very well yourself, I thought, when you sort of talked about the culture of the family. Um, these class cultures are something that a lot of people are now focused on. But their way of doing it is sometimes a little too qualitative. Finding the right mix of quantitative and yet having a large enough sample and covering a broad enough span and having enough detail, I think, hasn't quite happened, or I'm not aware of the work. But following what families of different social classes do um, would be very valuable. The real danger and problem here is, like everything else in science, we are constrained by our technology, and I think that um, sometimes we don't act forcefully enough to break through those constraints. In particular, um, most people are like me who do large-scale quantitative work. They rely on the large-scale quantitative data sets that have been assembled. Those data sets are really very restricted in this domain. The most they ever do is there's a guy who I would think you'd have interviewed by now uh, named Bradley. And he invented, he's at University of um, uh, someplace in the South, like Alabama or... Uh, and he invented a school, a, a score called the Home Score, H-O-M-E. Right. And basically, it's on the big data sets I use, so everybody uses it. And you get a cognitive support dimension and an emotional support dimension. And both of them are quite predictive in, in big data sets, so everybody's kind of happy with that. But when you look at the items, you find that the cognitive support tends to be things you can easily count like, does the family get a newspaper? Do they get a book? Do they get this? Do they get that? It's not anything like the level of detail that Hart and Risley did. On the emotional side, it does include things like, well, the interviewer was in the house, and so she records whether she saw the mother hug the child once during the time, and things like that. Insufficient granularity. That's right. And so nobody who works with big data sets has anything better than that. And the people who work with small data sets tend to create their own measures and be very small and not be as big as Hart and Risley were, where they went to the trouble to record 30,000 pages of conversations or something. And so Hart and Risley are a kind of medium size, do it yourself, customize it, and get it kind of on the big side. And I think that's pretty rare. I can't state another one that's like that. Now, once again, it's not really my a field. Representative sample, but a small sample. Right. That's, that's right. Criticism. That's Even right. It's been very widely that's right. So. Okay. This leads to a couple of other questions. Um, right. That are, that are important to me. For example, 
Um, suppose there were there were a group of people that had you know uh, five or ten thousand volunteers around the country working right. with uh, uh, families right. that were in um, the areas that we're talking about in terms of uh, across a spectrum of different kinds of vocabulary and emotional behavior. Right. And they were willing to do this. Right. Right. And that we were using today's uh, digital audio recorders, and we could suck this stuff up by computer without right. anywhere near the same degree of right. difficulty associated, what have you. Could you, or could you imagine that from a pure design point of view, that we could design something that would be much more effective? Would that be the interesting to a right. psychologist or something like that? Yeah, I think it would be interesting. I think that a lot of things like this are good ideas that never happen or never happen at the level of quality to make them worth the trouble um, because of the infrastructure, expertise, and focus that would be needed to carry it through. That is to say, um, you, I, I think you could assemble, you could, for example, use that technology I saw at the Society for Research on Child Development, and you could even, you could get people to um, videotape, perhaps, uh, dinner conversations, and you could have a large sample of those. But you would have to have people with real expertise and lots of training and time to code that up in a meaningful way. So that piece of it would be expensive. That is to say, you'd have to find a way to get the people with the expertise to focus their energies and technology on getting that part of it done. I don't think it's impossible, it's just well, that if as... Did, if we did it with video, whatever, I mean, if you took the, right. you went to one extreme, you said, okay, I've got a you know, 180 degree uh, bulb, uh, multi-angle view, right. um, you know, uh, video, and I'm going to use a technology like you saw, it's right. going to uh, look at uh, facial things, and right. pick up that, and right. make some affective or right. read about what's going on, and then um, weight the words in terms of other right. you know, levels, so that you've got that, but even if we didn't do that, if we just took audio streams, right, right, for simplicity, so right, we got something that was more extensive, richer, right. greater sample across greater right. range, right, um, could that data, if it was good, right, the way it was collected, could that be right. fed to a group of grad students to codify? I think it could, but you'd, I mean, essentially, the for example, the right person to ask this would be Hart and Risley. They went to a lot of trouble to figure out how to process all the data that they created. And I get the impression that they underanalyzed the data. Yeah. That is to say, all you get are a couple of charts in the... Uh, clipping the peaks. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and so... I would certainly be interested in being part of a group and would probably, you know, donate my time to participate in a group of people who wanted to do this. But I don't think I could be the point person. I think it would have to be somebody like Hart and... Right, 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 right. It would be great. That we could put together a team... I love it. ...that could design a really blue ribbon study... Right. And then use the organizations. I mean, there's, you know, right. there's teachers, there's an institute, right. there's the end. You'd, what, the kind of thing you'd have to worry about, I think. Uh, let me give you an example. I, I don't think this makes very good video right now, but I'll... Um, right. About these data sets. Um, use, um, it's bothering me right now about the ECLS. Um, the measures of what parents do are really inadequate. What you get is how many clubs does this kid belong to? How many times do you take him to a museum during the month? What you don't get is the real detailed things they do helping the kid learn. I don't think anybody really has that information. Or cope with how they feel. Right. About learning about That's right. And what I like about it is that it really comes down to documenting the true variation in detailed parenting 
in the country. And if you had such a thing, it would be a very saleable product, it seems to me. In a sense, it would be a super Dr. Spock. And the audience for that is tens of millions of people. And so one wonders whether it could be, um, I mean, one thing is everybody always thinks of government grants, and certainly Whitehurst and those people are more than ever before funding such things. On the other hand, one wonders whether a nonprofit foundation couldn't be set up in which ultimately you would sell the book that would teach all the parents about what they've been doing and how to do it better, and whether the market for that wouldn't be the sky's the limit because you're doing something that's of such great interest to the country at large. You know, Time Magazine could have a special issue on it. Yeah. yeah. The market is large. I, I'm attracted to that, and I'm attracted to, look, there, there's organizations like uh, um, Parents as Teachers, there's organizations right. like the NCFL, there's, organ there, there's so many organizations out there that have positioned themselves in the family in the early years, right. right? Right. How do they come together and learn how to communicate more of a thumping orientation to those parents? Right. Right. So that because because wh whereas the uh, we're going to see some ten percent or twenty percent incremental improvement from the middle class that would go flock to buy the book and they would they right. buy it, right right right. That, that's not going to shift the, the inequality difference right. that you and I are concerned right. about. Right. That requires something else. And, right. and it can't be Louisa Moat's rocket science. Right. It's got to be something more basic. I don't have to tell a parent to look when they look at their child's skin knee, wait a minute, that needs stitches. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's okay. Right. That just needs a Band-Aid. Right. We need to get to that kind of level of quick, direct, clear. Right. Boom, right. kind of awareness right. about these fundamental indicators of the health of learning itself. Right. Now, just while we're talking about this, this is where a number of people are focused, but they always seem to come up upon their own personal limitations. Um, I said we're having this conference in the fall. The fourth person who's going to be there, who I didn't mention, is Annette LaRoe. And she is the sociologist who is doing this. And in, the, in sociology as a whole, she's the qualitative one who does it, and I'm the quantitative one who does it. Annette wrote an entire book about 10 families. And her book has won every prize it, there is to be won in sociology. And it's assigned to students. It came out a year or two ago, University of California Press. For an academic book, it's a bestseller. And everybody loves Annette. And what Annette did is rediscover this fact we all know uh, of the class differences in child rearing. And she named them. That's very important to name things if you're going to get famous. She named what middle class family does concerted cultivation. And, what she, and she named what the lower class family does the accomplishment of natural growth. And she says, uh, let me get you the book. What she, get the mic on. Oh, what, let me, here. What she says is that, think, uh, the real basis of social class in America and all of the small actions that go with that. Which is to say, if you want to see a bad household, go look to a place where the mother was a high school dropout, where she's depressed, where there isn't adequate control of the kids, where there are too many kids, where et cetera, et cetera. It's all going to be less order, less organization, da 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 da. And that's going to go along with resources and um, uh, education and a volitional interest in really doing this, which it won't, it won't track social class perfectly. Um, you may find, some people say there have been findings that very religious families do a particularly good job. You may then get into this whole literature. Um, Diane Baumrat, Baumrind, I don't know how you say her name, at Berkeley many years ago invented this distinction, another qualitative researcher, which, because it's nicely named, has survived, even though I think a lot of people believe empirically it doesn't hold up. 
and that is between authoritative and authoritarian parenting. Authoritative is the good kind, where you lay down the law in a reasonable way so everybody's comfortable, but you're also warm and nurturing. Authoritarian is you just tell them, shut up and stay in your place. Now, the fact that that, too, has often been associated with social classes, and then that interfaces with kind of progressive child-rearing, and, you know, you get into all the great hot-button items. The all these things bear on it, but, they, but we care about the physical health of mm -hmm. our children. Mm -hmm. We care about the physical health of our children. Mm -hmm. We care about the emotional health of our children. No, right. That's more fuzzy. We're not right. sure about that, right? right? We care about their success in school. Right. right. It seems to me at the center of all these different dimensions is how well they're learning. Right. The health of their right. Not what they're learning about in this particular thing or that particular thing or that particular thing. But generally, how healthily are they learning? Okay, here's what you're going to discover. Yeah. You can go out and see it every day for yourself. Go to Wegmans, the upper class supermarket here. And you will see uh, middle and upper middle class moms with little kids in the basket with them. And they are picking something out and they're saying turnip. They're turning everything Turnip. Yes. Right. Yes. Everything is instruction. Yes. This kid is their hobby. It's like having a dog to hug when you don't have the kid anymore. I mean, right. nurturing is the American pastime for the middle class, particularly the upper middle class. But this is, this is implicitly connected to the health of learning, but not necessarily consciously and explicitly the intention. Right. Even the upper middle class are not saying, gee, I mean, we, we, it is not part of our common lingo at this point. Well, you know, Annette Leroux might say it is. She might say that, you know, what about the phrase soccer mom? Well, really, it got very widespread that moms would put their kids in the um, van and take them to soccer. We did it. Everybody at a certain age has been through the experience. Well, who did it? I think it was a social class thing. Um, they're the same people who were teaching their kids the name of turnip. Who didn't do it? Hispanic mothers in the barrio, I think, didn't do it. African-American mothers who are depressed and in the projects didn't do it. Um, it's class and ethnicity and education. What makes, it, what makes somebody's learning healthy? As opposed to not healthy, in terms of, uh, of, of the, the way that it's, uh, their learning is... Um, uh, uh, be getting more learning? You know, you really ought to go talk to Annette Leroux just to give her her due on this because, you know, she spent years thinking about this. This was actually, she did an earlier book, this was her dissertation at Berkeley. She went to two communities, a working class and a middle class, and she wrote a book called Home Advantage. And it was about this. And then she went and did this other book. It's, she's uh, essentially, since 1987, she's been doing nothing but thinking about the difference in social class child rearing. She's at Temple University. It's not far from here. Uh, anyway, um, she will be coming to the conference in the fall. This fall, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're back up here. We're in Cleveland in uh, late October. When is this? Early October, I think. October 11th or something. What haven't we talked about that you think we should definitely get in? Okay. That's really covered that right. your first pieces really hit the jewels okay. that I was most interested okay. in, in getting relative. Let me tell you about my greatest fear. My greatest fear is we're not going to make a whole lot of progress on this. Um, I come from the sciences, and I like to see success. This whole business of knowledge in the sciences is knowledge for use. And whether it's engineering or medicine, um, the value, the proof is in the pudding, the value is in the doing and the using of the knowledge. Um, an economist wrote a book called The Moon in the Ghetto in which he said, isn't it amazing that we can solve a terrible technical problem like going to the moon, but we can't help the people in the ghetto. He wrote that book in the 70s, it's still true. Um, the problem, in my view, is um, one of implementation and one of a powerful enough treatment and a powerful enough set of forces brought to bear 
with enough expertise and enough energy to actually move something in the real world. Um, if I were a betting man, I would say I'm going to die without seeing much improvement. That is to say, without much narrowing of the social class differences in these things, without much of an increase in the um, relative performance of kids from the lowest income households. In fact, most of the forces are against it. Um, since we agreed that everything is in the family, you ask what's been happening to the family. Answer, the number of children raised by single parents is higher. Um, in general, the resources available to um, families at the bottom relative to families in the middle is probably worse than it used to be. Um, the low performance of the DC schools I don't think is improving despite everybody's awareness for a number of years about the problem and so on. Um, what I would like to see is more powerful interventions brought to bear with um, more effective implementation. In particular, I would like to see a relatively large-scale program where you get kids in preschool, um, work with them to, to learn phonemic awareness, letters and sounds, then follow those same kids into kindergarten and get them starting to read and have some extra staff available to help the lowest and then get them in first grade, show to yourself and others who are watching that you really have gotten them to first grade higher than people. For all the resources that are available out there, I mean, everybody likes to cite what percent of the GNP is in education. I don't see much that resembles what I just described. No, I mean, $550 billion going into K-12 with a 20% effect, $6 billion or $8 billion going into Head Start with a, with, with a much right. bigger effect. By the way, one of the secrets, one of the ways it could be done that it isn't being done is the way I pioneered it, which has not been taken up, which is using uh, college students who are trained, whose education level is very high, so you're getting very high quality person power, and paying them a nominal amount because it's really hard to get good work for an extended period without any compensation at all. And the reason it doesn't happen is it's not in anybody's political interest, and there's a lot of other people whose political interests are different. Um, all this tutoring money has been taken up by big companies that have, some, in some cases, Sylvan Learning, and in other cases, companies have come into existence to do it. Um, the teachers have no interest in having somebody come in and do one-to-one -one instruction at $7 an hour when they're paid $40,000 a year. The superintendents have no interest in bringing in outside people like my Penn State tutors when they want to pay reading recovery the $200,000 a year they get for these things. The researchers have no interest because it doesn't let them write another article. It falls completely between the stools.